Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're now very pleased to have Pedro Vieira, um, whose talk is titled, Where is String Theory? Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation and for organizing uh, this very nice conference. And um, I'll be describing some uh, joint work with uh, Andrea Guerrieri and Juan Panadanes, and also some slightly older work with uh, also Andrea and Juan, but also Juan Miró and Aditi Abar that are these works that are quoted on the upper right corner. And these works are all related to the space of exploring uh, the space of possible uh, S matrices in uh, field theories, uh, the possible scattering amplitudes in theories. And mathematically, as I will try to describe, these are very much related to exploring what is the space of bounded functions. And uh, we will have to, to be specific of what exactly do we mean but you will see that mathematically, this will be very much related to having some function, some bounds on this function, saying these functions cannot be as big as they want. And then we'll ask specific questions about these functions. Please interrupt me uh, at any point. Uh, and if you can keep your camera on, it's always fun to, to see people nodding or rolling their eyes or anything. So, okay. Uh, so my plan is to first start with a simple problem where we'll be the <laughs> so far so good. I see that not is not. So, <laughs> so we'll start with uh, two dimensions where we'll have a very simple math problem. And then I'll first describe the math problem to be, uh, okay, try to be uh, as rigorous as possible. And then I'll tell you what's the physics of this problem and why this problem is related to string theory. Then we'll go to 10 dimensions and we'll describe again, what is the math problem? And then what's the physics behind the solution to this math problem? And then I'll end with some speculations. And uh, as I will tell you, both the 2D toy and the 10D toy are related to string theory in different ways. The 2D toy will be related to the S matrix of the string world sheet, to the excitations on the string. If you think they are small ripples on the string and they scatter with each other, what is their S matrix? And the 10D problem would be related to the target space S matrix. If I take small strings and I send them against each other, what happens? Okay. So both will be very much related to string theory, but of course, 2D is much simpler than 10D. Okay, so let, let's start uh, with, uh, with some very simple problem. So uh, let me try to, to be as rigorous as I, as I can be, which is not very rigorous, but uh, hopefully good enough. So let's suppose we have a function S that is a map from the upper half plane to the unit disk. In other words, this is just a statement that this function S is bounded, right? It's smaller or equal than one. So this is one condition. It's an holomorphic function. And this function close to the origin, so close to the origin, which is at the boundary of this unit disk, this function has absolute value very close to one, namely it's one up to, some small s to the four. So the complex, I will use s for the value that parameterizes the complex plane and in particular the upper, the upper half plane. So it behaves like this close to the origin. And then it has some reality condition, which is that s, if I take some point in the upper half plane, right? And I take this s matrix and I conjugate it, this is the same as s at minus z conjugated. You see that minus z conjugate is also in the upper half plane. So this is reasonable. Okay, and s is holomorphic. Okay, so these are the conditions. And now we can write uh, some uh, statements. Okay, some theorems or some, uh, okay, I cannot write theorems. It's too mathematical for me. I'll write then, okay. Then the following uh, follows. Uh, so then the first thing that, um, that uh, would follow is the following. So first simple statement, if I have my unit, my upper half plane, so this is the lower half plane, so don't go here, lower half plane. So we stay in the upper half plane and we are here close to the origin. So this would be uh, the origin. Then uh, from the previous two statements, the first statement we can write is that the absolute value of the S matrix this S, sorry, this function S, I already anticipated what this will be physically, should behave like this. And we'll explain in a second why as exponential of I, some constant A times this complex variable S, right? So we are in the complex S plane. So complex value S plus 
another constant times the cubic power plus dot dot dot. I will explain in a second why this is true, but this is the statement. This is very close to the origin. You see, if you set s to zero, you get s equal to one. And indeed, s equal to one has this absolute value equal to one. And as I will explain in a second, this a and b are real numbers. So that's one condition. One thing that we will see. A second thing that I will say is that, okay, I can call it theorem or then whatever. The further we will see that this A needs to be positive. And I'll tell you what the physics of this condition is. Okay, that's, that will be trivial as you will see. And the second thing, another thing is that this B needs to be bigger or equal than minus 100 over uh, one over seven, six, eight. Yeah. That's a less obvious statement. Okay. So, so now my plan is, so first, let me tell you why this statement, why these three statements are true. Then I'll tell you why these three statements or how are these three statements related to physics. But since this is such a simple problem, let's first understand a little bit the intuition behind these statements, why all these statements. And again, interrupt me if you have any questions. So I'll copy this page, copy page and... I will just copy it again. And now I will scribble on top of this page to do the explanation of these statements. So first, let's see that the fact that the S matrix um, is very close to one would mean that close to the origin, it would have an expansion uh, as what I wrote. But naively, you could ask, so first of all, this you could ask here, why did I jump from S directly to S cubed? Right, so you could ask why, why no constant C times S squared in the middle between A and B, right? If it has an expansion close to zero, you would start with linear, quadratic, cubic, etc. Why do I jump from linear to cubic? So this, first of all, you see that there is this I here and this I comes from this property number three, from this reality condition. The fact that you have this reality condition forces the expansion to be such that there is an I there. If there was the C, this C for the same reason, because it comes with an S square would have to come with an I, just from this reality property of the S matrix of this function S. But then if it comes with an I, then it would violate the first condition that we say that the absolute value is one up to very high precision then it would violate this second condition. And therefore, there is no C there and A and B need to be real. Okay, good. Now, what happens with uh, this function then? Then we see that this function is a phase, it's exponential of I times a real number for real S. And so this function has absolute value one in the real line close to the origin. So indeed, at the boundary here, here indeed, close to the origin, indeed the absolute value of S is equal to one. So it's in particular smaller or equal than one, so it's in the unit disk. But what about up here? What about in the upper half plane? What happens to this function? We want it to be smaller or equal than one everywhere, not just at the boundary. And so you see right away that if you go now, don't go along the real line, but go to a point slightly up here, so if you take S to be I epsilon, so if you go slightly above in the complex plane, then uh, your S matrix, your function would be E to the minus epsilon times A. And this would be bigger than one if A is negative. And therefore A needs to be positive, right? So this implies that A needs to be positive, right? When we go an epsilon, we go some positive epsilon, the function must be inside the unit disk. So this epsilon needs to be positive. Now, everything here is kind of trivial. It is just a statement that if you have a function that is bounded on the boundary, and if it's holomorphic, it's actually bounded everywhere. And therefore, when we are close to the boundary and we go inside, we see that with one sign of A, the function will start growing and therefore be bigger than one inside, but it cannot be, and therefore it needs to decay and A needs to be positive. Now, this condition on B is more fun and uh, everything. So I think that all the statements so far 
uh, everyone would derive in a few seconds, but this one is a little bit more fun. And um, it's also simple once you remember something called these Schwartz peak uh, theorems or Schwartz peak inequalities. So this is a, a statement that goes as, this goes, to prove this, it goes as follows. Or one way of proving this is as follows. I want to show that B needs to be bigger than this. So let me construct a new function, S tilde. This function is also a function in the upper half plane to the upper half plane, but it depends on a parameter W. And the definition of this function is as follows. Let me define it. Um, I will need some space. Oh, sorry, let me just solve this here. So this function will be defined uh, as follows. We take S of Z minus S of W. W is some parameter in the upper half plane, some number in the upper half plane, divided by one minus S of Z times S of W bar. So you see W is just a parameter. So it's totally fine to take conjugation. We don't spoil holomorphicity, right? But uh, it's totally okay. W is just a parameter. The function is a function of Z divided by Z minus W over Z minus W bar. Again, W is just a parameter. It's totally fine to take W bar. And now you can easily see that this function is designed in a clever way that it is still a function from the upper half plane. Well, that's obvious, but it's still a function to the unit disk because it just turns out that you divided and mapped things in such a way that the absolute value that this function is still a function from the upper half plane to the unit disk. So how do we see this? We see this by just noting that when I am at the boundary of the unit disk and I take the absolute value of this function, this is still smaller or equal than one because I divide by something which has absolute value equal to one at the boundary of my upper half plane. And so the function is bounded at the boundary of my domain. And therefore, by the maximum modulus principle that says that function can only have maxima at boundaries, it's bounded by one everywhere. And therefore, it's a function to the unit disk. Okay. So again, it just follows from going to the boundary, to the real line, and seeing that in the real line, this function is bounded. It's still holomorphic. It doesn't, it looks a bit dangerous because I divide by something that has a zero, but that's fine. There is another zero up here. So it's totally okay. So it's still holomorphic. It's still bounded at the boundary and therefore it's bounded everywhere. So it's a function of upper half plane to the unit disk. And now this is fun because I have a new function that is bounded that goes to from, and now what I can do is I can take W and Z to go close to each other. And now when I take W and Z to go close to each other, and when I impose that this function is always smaller or equal than one, I will, start, I will start finding conditions on the derivatives of this function rather than the function itself. And in this way, by tuning Z and W and making Z and W both collide and both going to the origin, you can easily derive this condition that B is uh, bigger than this number here, just by taking Z and W to collide. So this would be what are called Schwartz peak derivatives that tell you that if you have a bounded function, there are derivatives carefully designed that have to be bounded and you could construct them in this way. And if you want to now take this function and reapply this definition to construct yet another function that's bounded and so on and so forth. And in this way, get many bounds on Taylor expansions of functions that are bounded. So this is a well-known technology for just bounding expansions of functions locally knowing that globally they are bound, right? So we just use that the function is bounded on the full boundary. Therefore it's bounded everywhere. And then we use this to construct clever functions such that expanding around the point and using this knowledge, we can constrain the coefficients of its expansion. Okay, so this is uh, how we would establish these statements. And uh, so what would be the, let me then go back to, to this and tell you what would be the physics of this problem and where would this problem show up in some physical setting? Well, let me move this here and get some space to write. And, uh, okay, so let me maybe get some space here. And then I'll tell you where, now I'll tell you, okay, first I'll ask if everything is clear so far and, uh, if the statements are okay. Okay, so now let me use a different uh, color, say uh, pink for the physics. And let's say what this function could be. So this function S of this complex variable, small s, would be, 
in physics terms related to the S matrix of these excitations of a three dimensional flux tube. This could be a, a such situation. Okay, so now the, I, I apologize for the most mathematical. The most mathematical people can just ignore this slide that I'm going to describe now and then I'll go. But I want to describe a little bit the physics for um, the, the physicists. So these excitations of the flux tube, so I put the flux tube, I'm in three dimensions. So I put the flux tube and there's still one perpendicular direction. And I have these excitations of my string. So it's like a guitar string, it has some excitations. They move at some center of mass energy. And this complex variable S would be related to the energy in the center of mass. Okay. And because it's related to, and these excitations, because I put the flux tube at some position, but could put them at any position, these excitations are massless. They are called Goldstone modes. They break the symmetry of translation of space time. So these particles are Goldstone modes. They are massless. And this would be their S matrix. Now, the energy is real. It's a real number. It cannot be a complex number. So these values up here in the complex plane, these values here is where we have the real world. The real world will be here, like real energy. If I do an experiment, I send two particles with some energy against each other. There is no complex plane, right? I mean, there is the real, the real values. Now, in the real world, this condition here, the fact that my function is smaller or equal than one, this is unitarity. This is the statement that for real S, the absolute value of S square is the probability that I start with two of these Goldstone particles and I continue to two Goldstone particles. And because it's a probability, it's smaller or equal than one. And that would be why this condition would come about. Now, this condition would come about in the real world, so for real energies. And we are imposing it everywhere. So where do we go from real energies to everywhere? Well, there is an assumption hidden here, which is that I can go to infinity by going along the real line. Then I go to a point that is infinity. And I'm assuming that nothing special happens at infinity. I'm assuming there is no essential singularity at infinity. So if there is no essential singularity at infinity, if I'm bounded in the real line by one, at infinity, I'll also be smaller than one. And therefore, if there is no essential singularity, if we assume this, then we will conclude that the function would be bounded everywhere at the boundary. So then uh, my function S is smaller or equal than one at the boundary of some domain where the domain is the upper half plane. But then if a function is bounded on a boundary of a domain is bounded inside the domain, right? because functions don't have maxima inside domains if they're holomorphic, right? Holomorphic functions don't have maxima inside domains. And then it will follow that my function is really a function to the unit disk in all points of the upper half plane. Okay? So that's what, where the physics of this would come about. What would it mean then, uh, this statement about how the function behaves close to the origin? Physically close to the energy, the origin would mean low energy when we do an experiment at very, very small energy. And the fact that my S matrix, my function that now I have the right to call an S matrix is very close to one. It's one plus something very small. It's precisely because these particles are Goldstone particles. So at low energy, they are very weakly interacting. They almost don't interact with each other. And that's why it would be one plus something very small. And the fact this something very small that would deviate by one is the amount of particle production. How much particles do I have? If I have no particle production, the probability of producing uh, two particles is one. But eventually I send two particles at very high energy, I start producing particles like in accelerators. And then eventually it will be smaller than one. But it starts weakly coupled. And then this is just some usual reality condition that uh, comes about in quantum field theory. It's just a consequence of CPT. Okay, good, so that's the physics. And then finally, what is A and B? What are these constants A and B? So then these A and B, these real numbers A and B are going to be effective field theory Wilson coefficients for the string effective field theories, for the string effective action. Right? 
This will tell you at low energy, the leading one is A. A, if you want, is just the string length squared. It just sets the units. We can set it to one, doesn't matter. The only thing we know is that it needs to be positive and indeed we just set it to one. And then B would be the leading correction to Nambugoto, the leading correction to the effective field theory, the first curvature correction. And what we would show here is that this leading correction is bounded. A priori from quantum field, from effective field theory, you could put any number you want, minus three. But now we learn, no, if you want to have a theory that is UV completed, that is, is not going to violate unitarity at high energy or something, no, you cannot put minus three. You can put two, you can put five, or you can put minus one over seven, six, eight, but you cannot put more negative than minus one over seven, six, eight. And so we would learn about the UV completion in this case of this theory of these Goldstone particles by studying these bounded functions. Okay, so here is the pink is the physics of this problem. So any question about either the math, which is here, or uh, the physics that is here? So this is really a toy model. So if there is any- I have a question. So this bound on B, is this related to this bound on four derivative terms that follows from causality? It's no, uh, not directly. It's a bit stronger. Very good question. So A, yes. The fact that A is positive, A, which is the leading term, this time A positive is exactly what you just said. If you take the original papers that study this bound from causality and you apply them directly to this case, they would say A is positive. Then B being bigger than this value is a little bit more, it's an improvement on, on that already. It's a little bit richer than, than that. I see. Um, very good. So, uh, so yeah, so that's the, this is the physics and the math is about functions of one variable. And of course we can derive lots of powerful things about functions of one variable such that is funny numbers, one over seven, six, eight, it's a property of allomorphic functions. Okay, so, um, so let me make a few obvious comments. So the first comment I want to make that is that uh, we, we could find, we could have find this result B bigger or equal than minus one over seven, six, eight with computers. I know it's kind of a crime to mention numerics and computers in such conference, but I have to, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and uh, how would you do it? How would you find this number with computers? So first I derived it rigorously, right? With these Schwartz peak derivatives and so on. So we have an honest analytic derivation. But it was, we needed to be clever to come up with these Schwartz peak combinations that define this function. Suppose we wanted to just do it by brute force with a computer. How would you do it? So one, you would say, I parameterize a general holomorphic function. So you make an ansatz for your function S of Z. Okay? This ansatz, let me use a different color. This ansatz would have N parameters. And depending on how good your computer is, you will take n to be 10 or 100 or 200. And then the second condition would be you would try to minimize beta, or in this case, minimize this uh, b, this constant b, subject to the absolute value of s has to be smaller or equal than one for any uh, real S. So in practice, what you would do again is you would do it at, if you are doing it in a computer, you cannot impose for all energies. So you would impose it at M values of energy, like S equal S1, S2, dot, dot, dot. And you try at 500 points and hope that if 500 is big enough, if M is big enough that the, it converges. And then you would hope that this number you could find, you just maximize, maximize over the parameters of my ansatz, B subject to the condition that S is smaller or equal than one. And then you would hope that this in the limit 
when n and m would go to infinity, that the limit of these numerics should converge to one over seven, six, eight. Now, I want to emphasize that this is what is called a primal formulation, a primal problem, and it's not rigorous. It's not. Namely, what we would be doing in this way is you would see what is B, how small can B be, and we would have a computer that is N, and we would say, if I have 10 parameters, I can go all the way here. So then I know this is okay for sure. Then I have a better computer with 20, and I find that actually I can minimize a little bit more. I can go up to here. And then I have a better computer and I have 30, and I find that I can minimize a little bit more. And then hopefully you extrapolate and you see that this looks like it's converging, and you will find that this value that it asymptotes to would be hopefully minus one over seven, six, eight. But you would never know for sure. You would never know that if, if when you reach n equal 400, it doesn't jump suddenly to minus five, right? You'd have to pray and hope, okay, it looks like it's converging, but it's not rigorous. In these problems of optimization, often there exists something called the dual problem. And I'm not going to talk about it except at the very end, but a dual problem does the opposite. A dual problem says, this is for sure excluded. And then it says, and this is for sure excluded, as I, and this is for sure excluded. And this is what a dual problem would do. In a way, we are constructive. We say, this, with this way of solving the problem, we would say, this B exists for sure because I constructed an ansatz and it is there. This function exists. With a dual, I would construct dual objects and I would say, for sure, you cannot have this B. And there exists also a numerical algorithm to, for the dual that I'm not describing here. Okay? And combining both, I would have two optimization problems, a primal and the dual. And eventually, this gap between the two problems should optimally close. And if it does close, then we sandwich the true bound between what is possible and what is impossible. And that would be the correct boundary of my problem. But for now, uh, but OK, this is a, uh, we are still going to use this primal formulation. It's not rigorous, but I find we find it very useful. So, and uh, if you do if you do it on the computer, I mean, you can do it this in Mathematica very very easily. You do get this one over seven six eight with many many digits, and you would convince yourself of this result that we don't need to because we know how to derive it analytically. Of course. So this is it about two dimensions. So now I would like to switch to higher dimensions. But it's, as I said before, it, it is kind of important that this is clear. Otherwise, higher dimensions is going to be too hard. So please ask me if you have any question about, uh, about this. OK. So let's go to higher dimensions. And let's do as we did in 2D. Let's start with a mathematical problem. I'll try to be precise again with a mathematical problem so that uh, uh, if you found this kind of physics description a little bit hard to follow, uh, this is a, we are doing a reset now, and we are going to start again with a new mathematical problem. So now, let and now you'll see right away why it starts to be more complicated. Now we have a function S, again a function that is going to be meromorphic. It's almost holomorphic, but uh, it will have one pole. But that's not a big deal. But the big deal is that it's not a function of one variable. It's a function of two variables. I'm writing it as a function of three, but you will see that it's only two. That's already a big deal. This function here is symmetric in these three variables. So I swap any pair, it's, uh, the, the result is the same. And it's a function from where to where. It's a function almost from the product of three complex planes for S, for T, and for U into the real number, the complex numbers. But now I'm going to say it's not exactly like this. So first of all, it's not from the full complex plane. It's from the complex plane minus the real positive line. So if I have the complex plane S, I take out the real positive numbers from it. So this I take out. And then it's a function from the rest. So what we, we would call the cut plane. So the plane minus this cut. 
So this is what that star means. And we have one for S, one for T, one for U. Okay, so it's a product of these three cut planes. By the way, each of these cut planes, sometimes we map them to a unit disk. And we think that it's a product of three unit disks. And then uh, we say that, say, this upper part of the unit disk would be this upper part here. This lower part of the unit disk would be this lower part here. And then it would be a function from three unit disks. But it's not exactly three unit disks. It's the, or not exactly these three cut planes. It's these three cut planes with the condition, a section of this manifold, which is S plus T plus U equal to zero. Yeah, so you take these three planes and you section it by, you quotient by this S plus T plus U equal to zero. Okay, so this is the manifold. It's a, the, a property that is very convenient for us is that this manifold is a Stein manifold, but otherwise think of it as three unit disks model of this condition that S plus T plus U is equal to zero. Okay, now what is the analog of the, in this problem, remember, I had a, a function. It was in the upper half plane to the unit disk. That's more general now. It's not a function of one variable. Then the second statement was something about the behavior close to the origin. It was one plus dot, dot, dot. Or in other words, we had this formula here that the S matrix close to the origin was something like this. This is now going to be different here. It's richer. And uh, what replaces the condition close to the origin is that this function behaves for as t u small, so close to this three-dimensional origin, it behaves like this, one over s t u, and then one plus a constant, I can call it uh, alpha. Alpha is the analog of that b in the previous problem, times s t u plus dot, dot, dot. That's the definition. That's what I define. My, my function close to this origin behaves like this. This one is like before fixing A equal to one. It's just setting the units. In the previous case, it was in physics terms, it was setting L string to be one. Here it's setting L plank to be one, but uh, this is not important. And then this alpha is the analog of B before this one over seven, six, eight. Okay, so this is how it behaves close to the origin. So we are still in the assumptions close to the origin. And then uh, what a, there was one more very, very important thing was boundness, right? This function was bounded. Without it being bounded, we could say nothing, right? So it was crucial that it was bounded. Now this function, you see, it goes to C. It doesn't go to the unit disk. So it's not bounded in that trivial way. And it's bounded in a slightly non-trivial way that I'll copy the formula that I have it written. So let me copy this formula and then explain. This formula is long, so I don't want to write it. So this is what replaces the boundness of the function. So, so this is how S is bounded. So let me explain. Ah, okay, no, it's written already there. S is bounded in the following way. So S is, follow, is bounded like this. So S, the function S itself, is here, is not bounded. But you if you do the following thing, then it's bounded. You take this S, T, and U, and you parameterize them like this. So the first element, you leave S. The second, you parameterize with this X, and the third with this X. You see that this is a nice parameterization that the sum of the three arguments is zero in this. Right? It's designed to be zero. You should be able to see there is a minus signs there. They are small. And then, you integrate that function with this C, and this C are Gegenbauer polynomials. They are spherical harmonics in 10 dimensions. So Gegenbauer polynomial. Okay. Okay, so now you integrate these functions, these Gegenbauer polynomials. They are parameterized by some integer L, and this integer L takes any even value 0, 2, 4, etc. You integrate this x from minus one to one as written here. You multiply, let me be careful of this. You multiply here by this complex variable to the power three plus four, seven, also known as seven. And then you construct a function for each integer L like this. And that's a definition, right? So this is a definition of my function of a single variable. 
Now I have an infinite sequence of such functions, one for L equals zero, one for L equals two, one for L equals four, et cetera. Then these functions of a single variable, they are bounded in the usual way as in the two dimensional example. They are smaller or equal than one. Okay. So that's, it's in this sense that uh, this function is bound. So these are the assumptions. And now I wish we had a theorem, but uh, it's really, as you will see, not super rigorous, but now there comes the claim with these assumptions. So this is the problem. I think it's well defined here. And the claim is that alpha now cannot take any value you want, but alpha is bigger or equal than some number that is close to 0 0.13. Let me say 0 0.13 plus minus 0 0.02. This, this plus minus just means that with our computers, we cannot tell exactly if it's 0 0.13 or 0 0.14 or 0 0.15. It's something like that. And so this is the mathematical problem. I have a function of two variables. It's three, but it's with a constraint. So it's two variables. And uh, it's a function of three variables. It's bounded, not in a trivial way. It's not like the function is smaller than one, but rather the projection of the function with these spherical harmonics is smaller than one for any integer, so it's an infinite set of bounded, boundless conditions. And then the claim is that these mathematical functions are such that this alpha must be bigger than 0 0.13. And this would be the analog of B needs to be bigger than minus one over seven, six, eight that we found in a previous case. Any question here? So um, this is, you, you evaluate this for real uh, positive S. Do you mean taking S uh, uh, yes. to the real axis from above or from below? Because you, it was defined on the cut plane. Uh, right. Uh, so from, uh, from above, but it doesn't matter because there is an analog of this reality condition that I mentioned, that the function on the right and on the left was the same. Here, the function is complex conjugate below and above the cut. So as soon as I impose that it is uh, smaller than one above the cut, it's uh, smaller than one below the cut because they are just complex conjugate of each other. Okay, so that's an extra condition on S. That would be an extra condition that the function here and here is related by complex conjugation. Yeah, thank you. Otherwise, this alpha would not need to be real, but uh, as it is like this now, it does. Any other question? Uh, yeah, are these uh, functions yes, L uh, also some kind of scattering amplitudes? Is that yes? The they are great question. I'm going to tell the physics why we care about this problem, and then I'll describe what's the physics of this. And you are perfectly right that these SLs they are scattering amplitudes. And the square of these SLs are probabilities, and that's why they need to be smaller than one. Okay, thanks. That's exactly true. Um, now, I want to emphasize a little bit the status before I describe the physics that uh, is related is exactly uh, what you are pointing out. Let me uh, uh, make again a few simple comments. So the first comment I want to make, and this would be related to Nati's question um, about. Uh, whether there is a relation to these statements of positivity based on causality, which is that alpha bigger than zero, actually we can show it as to be true. This is a theorem. But alpha bigger or equal than this number that is close to 0, 013 is not rigorous. Okay. It's a stronger bound, but it's not rigorous. Okay, so let me explain this a little bit. So why is alpha bigger or equal than zero for sure? Why is alpha, why do we know so th that alpha is bigger than zero? Alpha was related to the behavior of the function close to S and T and U equals zero, close to the origin. But it is possible, I'm going to sketch only the details, but it's possible to start with alpha. Alpha is some Taylor coefficient, right? Some Taylor coefficient of my S matrix. But Taylor coefficients, we can extract with some contour integrals, right, of something that uh, extracts these Taylor coefficients, right, of my Taylor expansion. And then we can manipulate these contours and end up with some integral from zero to infinity over real energies of something that is positive times the imaginary part 
of my function s at value t equal to zero. And it turns out that this quantity here is positive by virtue of this condition that we have uh, down here. Okay, that's it. And so alpha needs to be positive. Okay, so this condition implies imaginary part of T is positive. And on the other hand, alpha by counter manipulation can be related to an integral of some positive measure times this imaginary part. And therefore alpha is positive for sure. It's an integral of a positive thing. Now this condition, so that's rigorous. This is a theorem. This condition, however, is not a theorem because what we do is it's not rigorous since we have a primal formulation. In other words, what we do is what I told you before. We make an ansatz for this function of three variables. And then we try to minimize alpha by an increase the parameters of the ansatz and hope it converges. And of course, that's not rigorous because I never know when I have 1 million parameters in the ansatz, will I go to alpha very close to zero or, or no? Right? So that is an extrapolation. That part is not rigorous. Right? So let me show you uh, the picture or um, uh, let me show you a picture of what that emphasizes this. So this is our result that we get. This is the result of doing this exercise that I told you of optimization. So I start, I ask, what is the minimum value of alpha? So here in the axis, I have alpha minimum. What is the minimum value of alpha I can do? When in my computer, I put an ansatz with n parameters. So you can think this n parameters is whatever ansatz. I mean, we use some particular clever Taylor expansion, but you could imagine Fourier decomposition. You just have an ansatz that the more parameters you have, the better it should cover the full space of smooth functions. And you see what happens when you have very few parameters, you cannot minimize that much. When you improve the number of parameters, you can minimize much more. And so it means that this is allowed, and then this is allowed, and then this is allowed, and this is allowed. And then with a better computer, this is also allowed, right? And eventually this is allowed, but now it's not moving that much, right? It's starting to converge, right? It looks like the region that is here, this allowed region, It looks like it's converging and the value it converges, if you extrapolate, seems to be around 0 0.14. The red region, in the same way that this region would be allowed, the red region would be forbidden for sure. Because this is the theorem that we showed that alpha needs to be positive, right? So here it's forbidden for sure. But we believe the forbidden region is bigger. We believe it goes to 0 0.14. We believe the best is really around 0 0.14. But that we cannot prove because we are doing it from primal. If we had a dual formulation, we could establish it rigorously. Okay, so, so then uh, having said that, the question is of course, why is this interesting and why is this related to string theory or to this particular physics problem? Okay, so I should, uh, let me go back here, sorry, and copy this slide. So that I'll erase a few things and discuss a bit the physics, um, the physics of this problem. Okay. <clears throat> okay, good. So I need to get some space. So let me erase a couple of things and you can think if you have questions in the meantime. So of course, this is the same as the unit disk. I don't care about this. Let me, uh, let me erase this bound. This is the bound. Okay, and let me uh, let me let me erase this stuff. S of t plus z equals zero, and let me. Okay, that's this is fine. Okay, so now uh, back to the question of what would this function represent physically, and uh, what do these statements translate into? So this here, this would be the scattering amplitude, the S matrix the amplitude for scattering two gravitons against each other. So this would be gravitons in a, a UV completion 
of type to be super gravity. Okay. So what is this type? What is this scattering amplitude? What is it's an amplitude that depends on this gluons, on this graviton, sorry. And then uh, if these gravitons have momentum k1 and k2, this variable s, for example, is k1 plus k2 squared. And this t would be, for example, k1 plus k3 squared, where k1 and k2 are the momentum of these magnets, the velocity of these magnets, if you want. Sorry, just a reminder, we'll go maybe five more minutes. Uh, wasn't it five past the hour? No, it was five to the hour. Ah, okay. Five to the hour. Okay, very good, very good. Five minutes, that's totally fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. A little bit more, yeah. Okay. Now, and then this condition, S plus T plus U equal to zero, just follows from this moment adding up to zero and from this glue, this gravitons being on shell. So K squared is equal to zero. Then, because of this condition, this function is only a function of two variables. The two variables are physically just the energy that we scatter like before in two dimensions, but now also an angle, theta, right? Because we scatter two particles in 10 dimensions, we scatter, they hit each other and they go off at an angle. So now we have two variables. And what we are doing here by integrating over this X, this X would be cosine of that angle. And by integrating, we are projecting, instead of going to angle, I decompose this function into representations of SOD, so I'm decomposing this into the spherical uh, coordinates and spherical harmonics. So what I'm doing by this definition is saying I construct a two particle, a two graviton state that has definite momentum, like it has momentum four when L equal to four. So I scatter two gravitons in a state that has angular momentum four. Then uh, angular momentum is conserved in nature. So the final state also has angular momentum four, but it could have two, mag two gravitons or more. And so this S square is the probability that the final state still has only two gravities. And therefore, it needs to be smaller or equal than one because it's a probability. It's the probability of two gravitons with angular momentum L continuing to be two gravitons with angular momentum L. Then this value here, this is what is the leading behavior of this amplitude close to the origin in other words, at low energy. This is just super gravity. This is just low energy uh, Newton's law. This is just gravity, one over STU. And therefore this alpha here, like before, it is the first curvature correction. In this case, it's an R to the four correction to super gravity. And therefore, putting a bound on alpha is saying, no, this, this correction to gravity cannot take whatever value we want. From effective field theory, you could say, I can put it to be minus five. But we are saying, no, this first correction to supergravity, if you want a UV completion, this needs to be bigger than something like 0, 14, if you want to have a unitary UV complete theory. So that's the physics of this thing. This 10 is the fact that we are in 10 dimensions. And this four is where maximal supersymmetry enters. And I'm not going to explain why, but it's true. Just for the, for the actors. And so, uh, and that's it. Now, of course, we know one UV completion. It's string theory, right? So we know one UV completion, type to be, Strings, it is a theory that UV complete supergravity. And so we could ask in type 2B strings, what do we know about this function? And Michael and collaborators, they tell us the following. They tell us that this function starts with supergravity and in string theory, you get one over STU. And then uh, you don't get a number, you get a family of numbers that are parameterized depending on the string coupling by what is called an Eisenstein series. S of T U plus dot dot dot, where this is a so-called Eisenstein series, and it's given by some sum of some imaginary part of tau to the three halves, and then n plus m tau when you sum over all uh, non-zero n and m. 
And this is a beautiful function. It's a consequence of string theory. It follows from studying S duality of string theory. This tau is related to the complexified string coupling. And you can ask, what do we know about this function? And if you plot this function, and I'm really, really finishing, if you plot this function, this is what you get. Depending on where you are, this function can take a value as small as this, 0 0.14, and then as big as you want. So this function seems to take a range of values that go from 0 0.14 all the way to infinity. So at infinity, you would say that you are at weakly coupled string theory. So this will be weakly, ah, okay, weak coupling. Then the, ah, what happened? Okay. This would be some strongly coupled point, right? It happens at these corners of the fundamental domain. And curiosity or not, this is what we are finding. We are finding that we are studying primal, the primal problem, and studying what is allowed. This is what is the allowed region. We call it the garden. This is what is forbidden down there. We call it the desert. In the middle, there is something that we are not sure. We call it the swamp. We would say this is like the swamp. And the boundary of what's allowed, we believe the swamp is a desert. We believe the swamp is forbidden as well. We can't tell for sure because we are doing some extrapolation, but it looks like the boundary between of uh, what is possible is somewhere around here. And it looks very close to what string theory does. So it looks like string theory covers exactly the range that seems to be allowed for a UV completion and not more or not less. It looks like it's more or less that, that the numerics indicate that the minimum value of alpha, it's either string theory or very close to string theory. It could be 0 0.13, it could be 0 0.15, it could be 0 0.14, 0 0.14 is string theory. So since I knew I would be out of time, the, the, last, the, the next two slides I, I wrote down in, in advance. So what would this mean? If, this, if we could improve the numerics, what would it mean? So, so here is, uh, I think, what it would mean. So imagine we found that the minimum value of alpha is bigger than 0 0.14. It's like 0 0.2. Imagine this would have been the conclusion. This would say that there is a part of string theory that cannot be unitarized, that, would be, that we would have to throw away. Of course, we don't believe this, right? So we would be worried if our numerics were saying you can only go up to 0 0.2, because then it would mean that between 0 0.2 and 0 0.14, that part of string theory could not be correct. It would be ruled out, right? OK, so that we don't believe. Suppose the minimum is smaller than the minimum of string theory. Suppose it's smaller than 0 0.14. Suppose it's like 0 0.1. Then it means that there is some room between 0 0.1 and 0 0.14. There could be room for other theories that are not string theory. And that would UV complete supergravity. OK, it would be interesting as well. What are these other theories that UV complete maximal supergravity and that are not string theory? Of course, maybe other conditions like scattering of multigravitons and so on could rule them out. But uh, until we study them, there is room for more theories there. Or another possibility is that the minimum would be within numerical error exactly 0 0.14. And then it would suggest that string theory would be, would be the, uni, the unique UV completion of maximal supergravity. Of course, it's not the only explanation. It could be a coincidence or there could be some non renormalization theorem. There, there could be other possibilities. And to clear up a little bit these possibilities, I think what we really must do and what we are doing right now with Joao and Andrea is studying the other Wilson coefficients. Because, okay, 0, 14 can be a coincidence, but the next one will be 0, 0, 46. If we get 0, 0, 46 for the next one, which is another Eisenstein series, I will not believe it's a coincidence. But if we get just one, then maybe, yes, maybe it's a coincidence. So because I was giving this type of blackboard style, I could not put any references. So I think I'll conclude here and just say that uh, what we did was studied functions and bounded functions. First functions of one variable, and they were related to string theory, to the S matrix on the world sheet, to the two-dimensional S matrix of phonons on the world sheet. Then we went and studied bounded functions of many variables. Those were related to the scattering of strings on target space, to the S matrix of strings on target space. We found that the, this, this space of S matrices has a nice structure and a nice boundary 
that coincidence or not seems to be very close to the allowed space of string theory. Of course, the bound is not rigorous and it will be very nice to develop a rigorous bound that would not only say good, 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 but would say from the other direction, bad, 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 bad. And hopefully this good and bad would meet and we would have really a rigorous bound. Here is a beautiful picture, for example, from an upcoming paper by Andrea Guerrieri and Amit Sever. I, I think it's going to come to show up uh, tomorrow or a few days in a few days, where they do exactly this. It's a different problem. It's a gap theory in four dimensions, and they are revisiting some uh, some uh, very rich problem. And uh, I can tell you a little bit more about it, or Andrea can. But what they find here is, you see, this green part is what is being allowed, and it's converging to some region. But then they also manage to come from the other direction with computers from the other direction and rule out things. And then eventually they get these brackets that show that in a gap theory, the effective quartic coupling in appropriate units must be between minus eight and two. And, uh, and they can really bracket rigorously and make that into a rigorous statement that is really proven. It's not going to change anymore, even if you include more constants in any putative ansatz. Thank you very much. And sorry for going a little bit over that. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker for a very interesting talk. Um, so we're running a little behind, but um, we can take a few questions, I think. If anyone has a question, let them raise their hand. No? Actually, I see there's a question in the chat um, from Zoha. Um, perhaps are you seeing the chat, Pedro? Okay, let me see. In the 2D story and also the 10D story, could you explain why we can expand the amplitudes in uh, polynomials? So there are uh, logs, uh, etc. Yeah, good question. So, so uh, Zohar is asking uh, why when we expand here, do, uh, did I write um, this dot, dot, dot? What is in this dot, dot, dot here? And uh, Zohar is uh, completely right that in this dot, 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 the expansion is not uh, regular. There are logarithms and so on. The first logarithms, however, show up at higher power of S. So they are under control and we know them also. They are the square of the three level result. And they don't invalidate anything of what I said because they appear at higher order. It's still true that alpha I can extract through a counter manipulation in an appropriate way. And so they are under control. So the logs are there. And, uh, and indeed that's the statement that they, these functions take values in the cut plane, in the plane minus the cut. And the way we parameterize this function is we don't care what kind of cut there is here. We expand the functions around the safe point and we do some kind of foliation of the complex plane around some safe point that avoids precisely these cuts. And the behavior of these functions can be whatever they want. They can have cuts and so on. Of course, to define alpha, I need to make sure I can define it rigorously. And this in string theory, you can, because alpha comes at order s cube, and then the logs would come at order um, s to the four, I believe, or s to the five, I forgot. So it's, uh, they are well separated. In higher D, uh, in, uh, in 2D uh, uh, as well. You understand that which order you start getting lots. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, let's thank the speaker again. Thank uh, you. For a very nice talk. Clap icon here. Um, and let's, uh, let's take five minutes again. Um, so I guess by my watch, that means that uh, nine minutes past the hour, we'll begin. <laughs>